Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's an, and, and an honor. I didn't realize there's an added benefit that as uh, participants in this, we get to hear a lot of very interesting talks. So I appreciate to be invited. I work at MITRE Corporation. MITRE is a non-for-profit organization, not a contractor and not a government, which is why I'm here, uh, which operates R&D uh, research centers for the government, most branches of the government. I'm going to talk about uh, social media having discontinuous underlying dynamics. I'll explain what, what that means. This is, this is work where we took a problem that didn't exist before, formulated it, solved it, then used some operation methods to make it faster, and then applied it to real data. And, and we've been working on um, more technology transfers, which are sort of beyond the scope of this paper, this talk. I'm not sure how to. Uh, Uh, this is work based on a paper that was just published online. Um, it's an open access paper, which means anyone can get access to it. And it's an extension of work with a colleague of mine, Beth Olson at MITRE. And uh, uh, this work has been related to a file patent that's last December. Um, the attitude that I have is that if there's a new source of data, however imperfect it is, and social media is a very imperfect um, source, one should use it. I have this picture of these giraffes here because I, I gave a talk at a Natural Science Foundation workshop last summer and stopped by the wildlife reserve and I discovered the day before on vacation, I discovered that animals like to stay near giraffes because giraffes are tall and they see dangers before the people, other animals do. So if you stay near a giraffe, you're a little safer. And that's an example of a, an imperfect an imperfect uh, data source that's, that's useful to use, although it's very imperfect. Some people think that Twitter messages don't have much content, and many of them don't. It's, it's really ignorant to think that none of them don't, but many of them don't. But the point of this talk is not what is the content of a single, inf uh, a single um, Twitter message, but what if you have hundreds of thousands of Twitter messages? Is there content there, and how do you glean that content? Uh, the story of what this work does is we start off with 380,000 Twitter messages, and there's a method to take that, there's a number of methods to take that and convert it to a graph on the right, where the horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is intensity of emotions. And in this case, we looked at three emotions, an anger emotion, a sadness emotion, and sort of a positive emotion. There's a method called loop, which is what I use, but there's many ways of, of making a graph like that. So therefore, you, you start off with lots of Twitter messages, and when you're done, you have a graph of, uh, of sentiment. The problem with it is it's, it's very hard to, to make sense out of this graph. The, the data's there, but it's, it's extremely noisy data. But thankfully, operations research and analytics can help I developed a new algorithm which basically takes this data and when it's done, it identifies dates in which there's a, change, a discontinuous change in emotions as well as tries to interpret what is, the, what is the pattern of the different emotions in these different regions. So we have what I call a breakpoint, which is times in which um, there's a discontinuity and then there's these regions of continuous dynamics. If you have data and you want to smooth it or make sense out of it, you basically need an underlying model. So for example, if you want to track stuff, you use Newtonian physics. That's, that's a dynamic model and basically a, a generic approach is you calculate the difference, the, the error difference between what the, the th your theoretical model says the dynamics should be and, and your data and you, you do some sort of least square, you, you, you solve for the, the missing parameters. The problem with emotions is they're not stuff. I would contend that a good model, and there aren't, there aren't great models of dynamics of emotions, but I would, I would contend that a good model is a, a very simple continuous model interrupted by discontinuous um, shifts. Maybe it's caused by a tipping point, maybe it's caused by an external event, but it's not Newtonian physics. So the model I have, the model I'm proposing for this talk is assume that each emotion has a constant velocity, it's a straight line, but then suddenly changes. 
Okay, to analyze this, there's one basic equation which um, I'm proposing is, is the right way of looking at this problem, or the right way to start looking at this problem. And I'm going to build this slowly. So we're assuming that emotions are continuous during periods and there's discontinuous breaks. Suppose we look at one continuous period, and suppose we know when all the breakpoints are. Imagine that x is the data that we have corresponding to the jth emotion and the kth region where this is continu continuity, and m are the breakpoints, which we're going to assume are known. Well, within a breakpoint region, this is a very simple problem. You just you could use a linear regression to find this velocity. If you think of a, a constant velocity as a good model, you construct A so that you're finding this velocity. Maybe you think a constant model is good, that emotions are basically uh, constant and then have discontinuous change. Maybe you're fancier and you want to use more sophisticated models. I actually think that a linear model is a good model, but this framework can handle more sophisticated methods. But there's a problem. Some points in time are more important than others. And the, the biggest reason for the, there's two reasons for that. One is that maybe you're more interested in the, in the recent past. But the more important reason is some days you, there may be more Twitter messages than others. So therefore, the error that you have, the error in the noise will be different on different days. So therefore, you, shouldn't t you, should, you should weight the, um, the different times differently. You should sum over the different emotions. And maybe you think, maybe you think that some of the emotions have different, should have different weights than others, so you could attach that. And there's different periods of, discontinu of continu discontinuity. You sum over those. And then you just take uh, the minimum of that whole shooting match. This, is a, this, in a way, looks like a complicated formula, but in a way, is an extremely simple formula. It's something that's it's using linear regression. And this you could view as a recipe to solve this problem exhaustively. However, another way of looking at this, this, this formula I just showed you is on the left you have all this data. You put it into this black box, which is that formula I showed you, and out comes the breakpoints. But there's a better way, which would be a recursive algorithm. A better approach is you have the data up to time t, you have one more piece of data, and then you loop back. And to find this, you use a classical operations research method called dynamic programming, which, which you all know about. Uh, if you do this, then you, have two, you achieve two things. First of all, you have a faster algorithm. But also, you can compute things on the fly. You can compute the breakpoints. You get one more point, and then you see how the breakpoints change. So you could watch how things are changing with time. There's a lot of details which I won't show you. You could look at the paper to see the details. There's a number of issues I didn't talk about. Um, in this development of this formula, I included um, an implicit assumption which I didn't mention, which is I assume that you knew the number of breakpoints. To do this, the approach I said you had to know the number of breakpoints. Well, sometimes you could have a good estimate. You might think there's a few breakpoints during a year, for example. But we developed some heuristics that are listed in the paper that describe ways that we could automatically compute breakpoints. One of the things we're concerned about is that we don't want people to look at the data and make decisions because people are very good at finding patterns where there aren't any. We want to have an objective algorithm which, which gives an answer, which maybe people will, will change a little bit or react to, but we want something that's you know, untouched by human hands. We also discuss in the paper how to calculate the relative importance of weights. Forecasting is a very difficult problem. I think that what, what we did in the paper is to touch the subject, but we certainly didn't answer all the questions about it. So let me explain the data that I showed you before. The largest uh, sports franchise in the world is a soccer team called the Manchester Football Club. I'm not sure why they call it football. Um, there were around 3 million Twitter messages that used their hashtag. MUFC, um, I had access to around 10% of that feed. And these are, these are Twitter messages that people gave permission to go to the world. When you put it through our Luke algorithm, we get this graph, which I already showed you. When we applied our algorithm, we get this graph, which I already showed you. But now let's go a little step further. Let's, let's look at this. What are, what are these dates? It turns out they're, they're 
February 6th and May 14th. So now you can ask the question, suppose you're interested in Manchester. And by the way, looking at sports is a metaphor for looking at a lot of different other things. Um, um, I picked it because it was sort of generic. You can ask, what, what, what's so special about these dates? Well, the first thing you should do is go on Google and find out about Manchester United. And what's nice about sports, what's nice about research about sports is there's phenomenal data. Um, there's what uh, people like to call ground truth. You could find the win-loss record for Manchester United during that season. This is a part of it. And when I did this, I was disappointed to discover that, well, nothing really happened on these dates. So these lead to two conclusions. Either this algorithm is overfitting data and we found something that isn't real, or we found something that you can't find from the obvious sources. And I'm pleased to say I'm here because it's a letter. Researching further, and the research was at two levels. One is to do more extensive Googling, as well as I found uh, what some might call a subject matter expert in Manchester United. MITRE has one employee who's a, a devoted fan. Discover on February 6, 1958, there was a plane crash, and a substantial number of the players had died. And everyone who's a serious Manchester United fan knows this. If you're in the UK, the days before this date will be on the, on the television. That's, that's probably why that was there. The May 14th date is fascinating. Nothing happened with the Manchester United team, but two of their competitors had a game that, first of all, switched at the last minute, and second of all, the outcome of that game affected the Manchester United team. So as a result of uh, that, perhaps one would argue that's, that's the cause of the second break point. So to summarize, um, we did two things. We, we formulated a question that wasn't there before, and I view this as the first step at trying to solve the equation. We, 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 we made it, turned it into a mathematical formula, used operations research methods to find a, a way to solve it. And we found we can say something about uh, mood shifts that uh, seems to be correct. We've applied this to a number of different other problems besides sports. What, what, I, what I think is most interesting about this is that we found a break point. We found something that wouldn't have come from obvious sources. If you didn't have this algorithm and you wanted to find out when were the big events for Manchester United, you would have gone to the win-loss record and you would have stopped there. The algorithm doesn't explain it, but it raises a question. It's saying, wow, uh, February 6th might be important. In uh, preparing for this talk, I was thinking that if you, if you submit a paper for interfaces, you have to um, get someone to say that it's, it was used beside yourself. So I, uh, I, talk, I sent a, an email to um, Dr. Dylan Schmurrow, who was, wanted to be here but was unable to for, for reasons. He's the former Assistant Director for Human Services in the Office of Assistant Secretary of Research, of Research and Engineering. He partially funded this work, although much, much of this work was internally funded at MITRE. And this basically says that um, this work was put into a, a bigger project within MITRE called Social Radar, where this was one, one component which is trying to look at, in general with social media, how can you analyze it? And this has been um, um, demonstrated to dozens of parts of the government, and we're trying to get people interested and, and take it to the next level. I mentioned that uh, we applied for a patent and the government, I don't know whether it's by law or by policy, but MITRE doesn't charge the government for intellectual property. Um, but we, fight, we applied for a patent. We're also talking to other commercial firms to set up a license agreement. With that, I'll stop. That's for questions.